planning on are you still planning on coming to my house on the sixth or something yeah i'll um that's when i got my plane ticket okay but well, hopefully it doesn't get canceled because of covid but yeah well i've got okay. this guy that sells well, like he says, risk management cars under ten thousand dollars. You know that he is a he's a master mechanic, and he goes to auto auctions, and he has these a, a, a lot of this uh, analytical equipment that they use um, on uh, vehicles to test engine compression and oil leakages, and you know uh, transmission, how the transmission works, everything. And he uh, only buys ones that uh, he thinks are going to be uh, on a risk management basis, not a liability. You're not going to be buying a liability. You know, when, when we sell forklifts, uh, you know, um, and, and you know, you know, you find this often. It doesn't matter uh, how if it, that you always sell it. For no less than three thousand dollars, because, it, but it can't, or more, any more than three thousand dollars at a certain level, because you have to factor in a major overhaul. You know, anybody who does it. Now, I don't know if that's changed now with all the used market being so, uh, you know, inflated. I mean, How much right is now, a new forklift? How much is a new forklift? Okay, well, um, a new forklift. Okay, right, right now. Um, a new forklift is uh, depending like at a 5,000 pound cushion or a 5,000 pound pneumatic, say, you probably would only need a 3,000 pound around where you are. But if it's a Toyota, you know, it would be uh, around uh, probably 25,000. But we yeah, are, yeah. We're, yeah, right now we're getting heli forklifts from China, which are about you know, anywhere from five to 8,000 less than that. And they're really good forklifts, you know, and they're from China. I mean, um, cause um, right now, you know, Toyota had a, um, they, they got a new engine for a, what's called a four Y valve, a new LP, um, you know, it's a gas internal combustion engine. And somehow neither one of them got approved by the EPA. So they haven't sh delivered any internal combustion forklifts since uh, like 2020, mid 2020. And, uh, you know, as a Toyota forklift dealer, that's not a good day. <laughs> it's our customers are. And so, we, you know, like uh, I'm seeing this used guy will buy a 2008 forklift, uh, you know, for uh, like $20,000. You know, that's ridiculous. I mean the, the 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 prices on the used have been bid up so high. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But we're hoping we can get a good good used car for Charles. Um, I uh, um, I bought we bought a twenty five hundred uh, dollar a car from him. It's a two thousand two Ford Explorer, and we've had it. It isn't for me, but it's for this kind of a homeless person that does. Uh, does uh, yard work for us hasn't had one issue in like three years. Twenty five hundred dollars. How's Gary doing? I don't know. I feel like I'm coming down with something. You know, Ooh. I hope it's not the uh, new COVID strain. Oh. You know, have you had COVID yet? No, you've had it, right? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if you heard what Phil Mickelson, you know, the golfer, said. He says, no. he says, if no one has died of Omicron yet and the symptoms are rather mild, don't you think we should just let it go and let it just get, uh, you know, go through the, like a flu, you know? I mean, well, uh, you know, it's funny. Vaccine cause... doesn't work on it. It doesn't work for me and Amy. No, the, the vaccine's worthless for it. I don't know why they're telling people to get the booster for it. It seems crazy yeah, to me. My... My grandpa has uh, vaccine boosters and everything, and he still got it and got sick from it. I'm like, oh, well. Uh, 
and my wife yelled, just yelled at me to shut up because <laughs> I'm I'm a conspiracy theorist. So you've been I'm, told. Yes, I am sorry. I did not mean to be a conspiracy theorist. But anyway, I don't know how she could hear me. Mm. I'd ever rather laugh, kept my voice carries. Well, Charles, did you have a dream or, you know, I've got dreams. Roy, do you have dreams? And Sure. Yeah, okay. Well, why don't uh, somebody send one in and uh, we'll get going on it. I just was telling uh, Roy, I, my, you know, my dreams, I, I, you know, one thing I, I say, I, this is just the idea of what we're doing with dreams. I mean, you know, right now, uh, in this day and age, uh, we live in a, uh, in poverty of symbols, of transforming symbols. The dream is the only thing we have to make a quantum leap out of our poopy literal self and, and adopt a new position. So we really need to be serious about the work we do. And it's, it's, it doesn't matter how helpless we are in our outer life. The dream, and it's as, as a root, uh, as expressing uh, this magical root that we were born with is uh, um, speaking a different uh, language. Anyway, Roy, did you send it to me? Uh, I'm just, it'll just be oh, another okay. minute or two. I'm working on it. Yeah, okay. Well, I just can, about there. I can read uh, one of my dreams real quick. I just, uh, it's rereading it. Uh, just a second. Just read it. It was a uh, uh, real quick. Uh, let's see. Um, this was, uh, um, uh, there were two forces in conflict over some technology issue. Now the two forces I'm saying are ego and body or ego and psyche, you know, and um, our side was the much inferior force. We were on the side of ego and we seemed to be congregated on the upper story of a tremendously large old storehouse, okay? So, so we, uh, the ego occupies the upper story of a tremendously large storehouse of wisdom, of, of the ancestral wisdom and the wisdom of the body. Uh, this doesn't last too long. And uh, it was uh, um, covered with vegetation, ridges, and walkways. It was very intricate. And it was very related to the plant world, the feminine receptive. It was dark. So it didn't have the light and clarity of, of the daylight world of, of ego. And, it was, um, and, and the battle seemed to be in preparation between really uh, who's, who's boss here, the body or the ego. And now we heard there were all kinds of women on the roof. Now this is very interesting. And I suspected I knew who was leading them. It was this girl who who broke up with me because she said that I put her on a pedestal. So it was, you know, the unreal image of the feminine, which occupied my, the highest conceptual level, the one that was farthest away from the reality of the earthly feminine. And uh, she um, shot at me, but with no effect. So she wasn't even real. It was like, uh, you know, when the, when the, uh, um, when Kama, you know, the throws, uh, Kama Mara throws uh, these spears at the Buddha, they just become flowers when they hit him, you know, because they were unreal uh, at the, at the point where he was, nothing was real. And uh, so then it, um, we went back down and at the bottom, there was a group of passive people uh, sitting at the entrance and someone fired at them. And they said, we don't care what you do. <laughs> he says, we have nothing against you. Go ahead with your wiki thing. You know, some, something you do with the conceptual realm. Anyway, it was a dream I had. What, Roy, did you send it to me yet or? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, all right, I'm gonna. It. And Charles, we're always uh, open to your 
Fever Dream. Okay. The White Bicycle. Um, that was, uh, you know, um, it seems like um, dawn streams all have, always have something white in them. You know, I mean, the white spider, the white woman, the white van, you know, everything has got some white aspect. Okay, I think this is the whole thing. Um, do you want to read it? Sure. You want some commentary on your dream? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, well, that's sort of interesting that uh, in a way you were sort of passive to the, the, the shot that the girl made at you. And then it's, it switched to a group of passive people. So that doesn't sound like real good animal communication. What do you think, Craig? I'm very passive. I mean, the, the idea is, um, I think I'm, I'm very much like the Dormouse in Alice in Wonderland. You know, but that's I, some pretty intense stuff coming from the animal, and it didn't yes. have any effect. Well, yeah, but she was the unreal anima. This one I put up on a pedestal, and she told me. She, it doesn't she, matter what form the anima takes. You were yeah. passive. Well, yes, and let me just mention the passivity aspect. The in intuitive never reaps the harvest. They, they, uh, they, you, you know, where the sensei, uh, this, this is Young says, the sensei says, uh, a sensei, a partner in a couple, say one's an intuitive, one's a sensei. And the sensei says, you know, I had a revelation. And then they tell you what the revelation is. And the intuitive says, I knew that 20 years ago. Yeah, but you didn't act on it. You were passive. I mean, everything that all the revelations that the intuitive gets never turn into reality because they their sensate function is so underdeveloped and unconscious. But the yeah, the, but that that needs to be worked on. Yes. you don't want to continue that. You no, need to I, get in the middle. You know, you're too polar. I know, but the dream is just um, telling me. Uh, that um, I am very passive. And, and, and the other thing, I think it's important that the, you know, the lower stories of this uh, big, vast storehouse are just full of vegetation and greenery. But on the highest, uh, on the roof of the storehouse, even above this high level that the ego is at, is the, uh, is the ethereal anima not the one that's connected with the earth, you know, and she, that's what she told me uh, in this human being told me this. And I think she sensed it and, and it was a surprise and a shock to me. This is before I knew anything about young or anything or projection or anima projection. She says, I don't like being put up on a pedestal. I'm a real person, you know, and yet I was treating her like she was a marble statue that was not real. But that so, could have been interpreted that she wasn't telling the truth because the woman in the dream was up on the roof in the spiritual realm. Yeah, if she was- You might, uh, have, uh, you might have misinterpreted her. You might have taken her as literal. And, and you know how women are. They are very mysterious. You could take something literal and you really took it wrong. Yeah, I mean, my wife always tells me, too, that I'm, uh, she tells me I'm sensory deprived. <laughs> well, tell me something else I don't know, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, she's talking about her daughter, her granddaughter is a little bit sensory deprived. She's going to send her a book about sensory deprivation to her daughter about her granddaughter who is sensory deprived. And she says, you're very sensitive to five, too. <laughs> yeah, yes, but uh, it is true. you shouldn't be passive about that. that that's really important piece of information. It's a very valuable piece So what of do you do about it, I guess, is the question. I mean, Well, yeah, you the, if you're into the collective unconscious and you're into your dreams, you're, you're being put on the spot. Right. You know, it's your turn. 
And I, I guess the one thing that I do do, and I don't think it's really that effective, but you know, is that I, uh, every morning I try to go deep into the body, you know, in sort of a meditation, you know, and I try to, uh, identify with my feet and with my heart and with my skeleton, with my skull and, uh, you know, my shoulders, my fingers, you know, I mean, that's the only thing I can do other than art. Well, you're, you're doing something mm -hmm. and then it should show up in your future dreams. Yeah. You hopefully know, it will. The feedback, the feedback. Yeah. You know, the whole thing I think it is, is saying is, um, okay, now here was something very interesting I had. Um, you know, uh, where Hermes Trismegistus goes up to the highest level and he achieves the complete revelation of the seventh heaven. But he knows this is worthless to me unless I take it back to the earth and to the uh, sensei embodied aspect it's absolutely completely valueless unless it's integrated into uh the blood you know the, what they call the rubedo that was the albedo but you need to bring it down to the earth and he knew that he could unless he can bring it back to the earth there is no strength in it and there's no completeness in it the only way that he could achieve completeness was to bring this seventh heaven down into the earth. And uh, anyway, it was. Uh, I, I totally earth. agree. You know, that's the big problem we have uh, on the planet. Now, science takes it to the earth. They actually deal with something that's a substance that's physical, that, you know, it's, they deal with practical things. They're pragmatic. And they're very successful. But there's all these other people that want to start in the spiritual realm or the etheric realm or the metaphor symbol realm. And that's not pragmatic. And they can't do very much with it because at the place that they're starting, uh, there's nowhere to go. There's no bridge. So uh, we have to start where the scientists start with a system that's real, with real physical things. You know, the science are right there. You know, we, we, we have to learn how to do that and, and then go across the line if we want to. But that's, that's it, Craig. I mean, we, we just have to deal with something that's, that we can agree that's real, that we can do something with. Well, and right now, according to the dream, the ego, and the body or the ego and the psyche are at war with each other they're not cooperating they're not collaborating and the, and the anima is is not a real anima she's even more spiritual than i am you know she's not one that's down at the earth well that's and then there go ahead gary well you know and i think that's because she hasn't been brought down to her. so my advice would be you know, that you have to go, you know, just actually kind of like what I told Don, you know, it's like you need to like, you know, so I, I think your visualization where you sense the body, I think that's good. But I think I do, you know, I think I do those key gong exercises instead yes. because you. that's like, you know, that's really, you know, that's, that's very connecting to the earth. That's very real. And, you know, it has, has a lot of sensations that go along with it, you know? I think so, if I, yeah, I mean, that, I want, first of all, I'd like to hear Roy uh, and Gary both talk about how they, because uh, Roy particularly, I think has connected with the sensate world. But I was just saying the one thing that really did seem to work for me was that cranial sacral therapy mm, until this girl went and got down to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and supposedly learned how to do it the right way. And then she came back and did nothing but work on my head. And she spent 90 minutes just feeling my head. That's, that's the one part of me that is, uh, it's way too much. But Roy, 
could you talk about your um, your uh, you you really have made a concerted effort to connect with the vegetative and sensate and instinctive realms almost above anything else it seems to be the highest uh, deity in your life right now yeah i'm i'm very much an intuitive and uh when i read jung in the 70s you know I, the types and i said okay you know I, i'm gonna have to do something in the physical realm to ground myself which was very hard so you know i've been working on it for decades and uh i didn't know what really to do that would be helpful i mean you can do anything it's better than nothing but sometimes things that you do is probably worse if you didn't even do them and and i think i kind of started off that way and so i, I kind of messed my body up because I, I i worked really hard i took a lot of jobs that were hard labor and i, I didn't use my body right and it and it uh messed my body up all out of line and stuff but my intention was good you know i was trying to do sensate stuff uh like i could suggest to you uh qigong is very good but you know uh you like music and you and you're a, a thinker and you're smart and you could do dancing any kind of dance that you want you could do different ones and and then amy could help you with that and that's a, that's a really good interaction. It's not that stressful on your body and it's real sensate. So I think it's important what you choose to do. You put, should put a lot of thought in it. It should be enjoyable and something that you're capable of doing. And so what really made the difference to me ultimately, uh, gardening was good, of course. That's what I was going to try to say. When, when I retired. about gardening when I retired, but by that time my body was messed up. So actually what really helped me really put it together was Adelaide because she was able to align my body so that I could do these sensate things and, and, they, and I benefited. Before when I was doing them with a messed up body, I wasn't benefiting, it was just making things worse. It's very important when you're in the sensate world that you get some help and you're doing something that it's enjoyable and 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 it and, and it works for you. You're the judge of that. You know that's what you want to do. Just don't do what somebody else tells you or what you think you should do. Uh, check it out and see if it's enjoyable and it works for you. And when you find that, you'll progress. Can you talk about gardening a little bit about your experiences with gardening? Uh, well, uh, what what are you like digging in the earth? smelling the earth, watering the right. plants. Uh, uh, all my ancestors were, were farmers on my mom's side and my father's side. And when my father retired, he went back to gardening. So it's all in my blood. So uh, of course, that's really good. Uh, but if your body's messed up, it's not that good because you're going to go out there and garden and you're going to strain the wrong muscles and then you're going to come in you're going to be tight and you have no way to loosen that up uh but gardening is wonderful if if your body's okay for that sort of thing well i'll say too, one thing too the key gong is great exercise as well you know as as sort of a chakra work and so gary, gary can you talk a little bit about your uh exercises in the sensate realm or what yeah i mean mine's uh, like i get up every morning and i do well i you know originally i was doing uh training on my bike but you know i wasn't making enough progress there so i switched over to using a uh, uh for my cardio i've been using a rebounder and the rebounders are really good because they you know they you know they're easier on your joints but they also, they cause the, you know, the stuff in the lymph system to circulate, you know. And, you know, if you're not someone that goes walking or goes running or, you know, does impact types of things, you know, your lymph system doesn't circulate and you build up, you know. So then, 
so you know then i do things like uh pilates and i'll do um you know i'll do some yoga um and then i you know but i tell you right now that qigong is just one of my real favorites it's a real favorite you know so you know then i'll meditate too but at, at the on this list you know especially you know if you you know, this sounds great, but if you haven't been exercising, the key gong is really gentle, you know. Yeah, but and it kicks it's, my it's very fo- It's very focused, and it allows you to combine the breathing, the movement, and feeling the energy, and just being very aware of it all. So, like, you know, you go out there and you do gardening, because I, you know, I do gardening mostly because I'm got i have a lot of landscaping and i'm not willing to uh use roundup and so you know i'm always having to deal with weeds and things you know (laughs) you know i'm I'm probably the blight of the neighborhood you know actually when it comes to it even though i probably do more work in my garden than anyone else but um but you know so gardening is a little bit risky you know because you can you can mess yourself up with gardening too uh so you know i think i think the thing is where you're being really careful about the movement especially if you haven't been real active or better and like the dance you know like i've and i could send you some of these too or you know or even just send you the site they were pretty cheap it was like 15 bucks but i'll like all the chakra dances but again You know, that's just, you know, you're just kind of deciding your movements and moving to the music and stuff. And I like that, but I felt more in touch with the uh, Qigong than I did with the uh, chakra dances. And then the other thing that I do, you know, is well, so I used to go, you know, I used to do the Reiki, which is very much like what, you know, you're. The, the cranial sacral, you know, but that's the problem with that is, you know, it gets expensive, you know, and, you know, and, and then the, but the, the other thing I like to do, and, you know, and I tend to spend a fair amount of money on this is going in for massages, you know, if you get a good masseuse, um, you know, it, it's, well, first off, it's really helpful just for, um, you know, if you've been exercising all week to kind of recover, you know, but also just for the sensation. And it's also, it's it, again, you know, it's, it, it's like it's really good for your lymphatic system. So, you know, it's probably even a, like a life extension type of thing. But I don't know, you know, like a I went bike riding on the day before Christmas down here. You know, we had temperatures that were warm enough for it. So, like, I, you know, I really like to get out on my bike and stuff. So, and then, you know, and even, like, yesterday I went uh, I went hiking with my group. You know, we did, like, five miles. And so I do, I do quite a few physical things. And... But the best of those for awareness and really being grounded, I think, is the key gong, you know. And so it's it's very easy to get, you know, that way you've got something that doesn't take that long and you can be very focused on your work. Yeah, it is very focused. And, you know, every one of my dreams is going to be like this. It just, it, it's really almost uh, scary. I mean, the uh, the dreams talking about uh, spoiled meat, uh, emaciated dogs, uh, conflict between where I'm way up high and, and I'm in conflict with that, which is lower, you know, and, and then the, the, the only um, feminine aspect of me is even more spiritual than I am. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, yeah, it is... Uh, and 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 then uh, as far as the passivity, uh, it is sort of a uh, uh, just a um, uh, again the intuitive who understands but doesn't act. You know, they they understand but they don't do anything to to correct what they understand. 
and uh, I think this is uh, also it's a little bit of it, and just a little bit, a lot of uh, of laziness, inconsistency, lack of purpose, and lack of persistence. You know, a day after day grinding it and never ever missing. You know, up there. So, yeah. Well, anyway, I could I can keep feeding you those, but. They're, they're very interesting, but I, I'm going to try to do Qigong every day. I, I tell the anima, too, that I'm going to draw a picture every day, and I'm kind of passive about that, too. But, uh, but drawing you, is definitely sensei. Yes. The thing that you do, where you like you, you prepare programs to do Sunday. You know, that's sensei. You have to do a lot of organizing. Uh, that, that's practical and, and, and very earthy. And the colors that you do in your drawing are the feeling function coming through. And, and the whole thing is, what is, is really amazing about doing dream work and doing uh, art of any kind. Now, this is just a little bit of a shift gears from the Qigong and the other things which are important, is it doesn't use the intellect. It is totally using the other three functions, you know, there's nothing intellective, and that's that's the I think why the dreams are so um, uh, so meaningful to me is because they I I know that I mean I don't know well I do know that they are using uh, not directed thinking they're not using the directed thinking they are using the metaphorical thinking that was the um, basis of all pre-Socratic uh, philosophy was based on non-directed thinking. And suddenly you had Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And, uh, um, you know, you should hear what this uh, Peter Kingsley says about those three, you know, how they were the, uh, they started directed thinking, started prose, prose writing rather than the metaphorical writing and it has even even though it's brought about great advances in technology and you, you know what one of the things it, it, young was always interested in the romans understood everything someone who built an internal combustion engine uh, understands today but they could never uh, make the machines there's the something triggered in like uh, the 19th century, you know, it was after the, the Renaissance, after the 18th century, after uh, Jefferson and Washington and Adams, suddenly when they started steam engines, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, there's this, uh, a, 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 and we just were off and flying. You know, you know one, one thing that's really interesting, if you ever watch, uh, you remember Jay Leno? And Jay Leno's garage, he has, he's got millions and millions of dollars for cars. But you should watch the one on the Stanley Steamer. It was the, the highest uh, level of, of steam engine technology that there ever was. You know, this, this was, you know, in the early 1910s. And, and so they, they, they had perfected the steam engine unbelievably. This thing could go 70 miles an hour all day. And you didn't need to add any fuel or anything. You, you'd already gotten the steam pressure in the, in the uh, uh, thing. And it would just, and, and it would be noiseless too. It just keep Actually, going. got a ride in a Stanley steamer at Estes Park. And the guy was demonstrating it. And, and he said, watch this. So we're going down a hill. And he moves it, you know, from forward to reverse. And then by the pressure he applied, he could control the braking. So he could brake through the steam engine rather than having to use the brakes. It was like just an amazing vehicle, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, the only thing with the internal combustion engine was the Stanley steamer. It, it takes an hour and a half to get that Stanley steamer uh, ready to go and that was that's very inefficient when you just want to go and turn the car and go you know so it was like a, it took a long time to get the boiler going and everything well let, let, anyway 
this has been very helpful and I'm going to keep feeding maybe one a, a session or something. And uh, now, Charles, if you have a dream, why don't you get it ready too? But what, let's go with uh, Roy's dream right now since he's got it in the text. Why don't you read it, Roy? Okay, let me just add that. Yeah, one thing that I did was study the sensate. Yes. You know, how do they do things? I would love and to. And so then when I, I don't know if Amy's sensate or not, but no, you know, she's there you feeling. go. Feeling. Well, she's intuitive well, feeling. There's somebody where you can study feeling. I study feelers and sensate people and, you know, all the different types, but mostly the sensate because I feel like that's where I'm weakest. And I'm lucky because I'm attracted to sensates. And uh, Adelaide's like a sensate, she's like an engineer. And I study how they do things. Now, I'm not particularly inclined to do things like they do, but when I, when I have to do something, I say, okay, what well, this is what, what would a sensate do? And I, and I kind of remember, and, and I do that, and it's very helpful. We, we got a million sensates at this electric <laughs> worker stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right, but, for yeah, sure. Yeah, this, uh, like this one guy who's in charge of the pump repair, that guy is a, is, is the, a sensate genius. I mean, he's the Einstein of there you go. Uh, there's your, there's mechanic. your master to study. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to do it like him. But when his imagination have, right? is like, you yeah. know. Anyway, yeah, it's we're, we're like complete oil and water. But well, He can you study know, you, you say, and you study him. You, you say that, Craig, but at the same time, I think that there's something about, you know, they just automatically know how to work with their hands and how to how to do things, you know. You remember that show? It was called Junkyard. Uh, you know, where they'd send oh, yeah, people yeah. into a junkyard and have them build something. That's right. That was a great show. <laughs> yeah. Somebody could go in and just take all kinds of stuff. And, and, and we've got all kinds of people that could do that. You know, there's the, the, the one guy that he's, he's kind of getting a little useless now, but uh, he, everything he bought was used and then he would fix it, you know? And so he'd save us a lot of money on lathes and, and uh, dynamometers and I don't know, you know. Well, anyway, let's let's go with Roy's dream. Uh, but I, I'll keep feeding it because yeah. it is it is a, it's it's painful to me to have these dreams, you know. And I know that. And I'm, you have I'm fix passing. it problems at the house. See, yes. you have fix it problems at the house. And next time for you blow one off, you know, try to calm down and and and, and practice. Yeah. Then you. I yeah. told Amy today. Right. Then you will see the caveman. When, oh, yeah. Whenever there's anything sensate, this unconscious caveman uh, is suddenly in charge, and I I don't know what's going on. But that's I mean, all right. He'll teach you. He'll teach you. Just slow down. Be he's patient. He's angry. And well, that's he, all right. He's inept. It's all right. You can cuss all you want. Plumbers cuss like a son of a gun. You know, it's, it's right. funny because I pretty much fix everything here. And I'll tell you this. Sometimes I end up with disasters that cost way more than it would have cost me if I just called somebody. You know? That's all right. You learned something. You learned something. Yeah. I wouldn't even I do too. a disaster. <laughs> I'd break whatever it is. That You, you know? got to start where you, you start. If you make a big mess, you call the guy in and, and just, you know, eat some crow and he'll fix it for you. You'll learn something. Just start where you're at. I always tell Amy, I use what's called the Craig method. I don't read instructions. I don't listen to anybody. I just start pushing buttons. <laughs> Come on, work, work. <laughs> no, you got to read instructions if you don't have any experience. I'll tell you that right now. It That's really was, helps. We were trying to put a telescope together. I still haven't gotten <laughs> it. We look in it and we don't see anything. I'm going to have to call the... Telescope company. The good thing is because there's so many immigrants, a lot of the instructions they they it's almost all pictures. Yeah, that's correct. But anyway, we do have a telescope that's not working right now. There you go. There you it's go. just we look even across the street, all we see is white. Uh huh. But, but but anyway, go ahead, Roy. Let's let's go ahead. Okay, one. the white bicycle on uh, uh, November the twenty first. Okay, I was way out at the end of a high wooden fishing pier. I saw a large shark. Then the pier started collapsing and people were running for the shoreline. There were a lot of sharks in the water. 
The next thing I remember, I was on shore. The scene changed, and I was a young boy with my father. We were very poor. We were Asian. We went to this Asian market to pick up cabbage leaves that the lady there let us have. They were the outer leaves of the cabbage, which no one would want. The woman said, the woman had this old white bicycle back in a storage area. My father asked if it was for sale. The woman said, no. I had this feeling that it was her son's bike, but he had died many years ago. I thought about trying to get her to hire me. I thought if I worked for her and did a good job, she would let me have the bike. This is a really interesting uh, shift in transitions here. So let's uh, uh, go, we're gonna have to do the, from this, that, and divide it into parts. So um, so the, the first part sort of stands alone, okay? Um, now, first of all, it's called the white bicycle. Now, this first part is sort of the introduction. It would be uh, like a, what they call a cold introduction, uh, that tells some story and uh, doesn't seem to have anything to do with what follows. And yet it is, is the introduction, okay? You are way out at the end of a wooden fishing pier. So you are, you, there is a, a, some type of a wooden fishing pier that reaches out into uh, the, uh, far into the unconscious, far into the collective of the unconscious. And below, you see some very non-human, uh, powerful uh, uh, um, entity. Okay, it's not human, but it is unbelievably powerful. I mean, it's like Idzubar or whatever you want to say. Okay, uh, so you're you're seeing it there. Okay, now you know that it's dangerous, and that you're far out from shore. Then the pier starts to collapse. So in other words, now we are going to fall into the con unconscious and we are going to be at the mercy of this unbelievable, uh, uh, powerful um, entity that exists in the unconscious. And uh, um, now, Roy, people are running for the shoreline, but you are at the very, very end. I mean, there is, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of hope for you, really. And uh, now there were a lot of sharks in the water. So um, that, it doesn't really tell us what happens, but what it, what it is saying is that if we go too far out into the, no, I'm not saying it's saying this. It's just, it's just showing this. That, that there's an image that we are very far out onto the unconscious. And if that, that aspect below us, which supports us, um, it stops supporting us, um, there's a threat of, uh, of a, a really annihilation, you know? I mean, in other words, um, the idea is, is the, um, that, um, uh, the unconscious is very powerful and we need to make sure <clears throat> that what is under us is, <clears throat> you know, is, is strong enough to, to make sure that we don't get somewhat dissolved in us. Now, <clears throat> this seems a little uh, odd for you, Roy, because I think you have a fairly strong ego and very resilient, you know, but let's keep going into the next part. Now, that's all we, all we know there, okay? It's just that the unconscious is powerful and dangerous, and it needs, if you're going to interact with it, you need to uh, have very strong supports uh, under your dock or under that aspect that took you out there. Okay, now the next thing you remember, you were on the shore. So as these people were running for the shoreline, somehow you made it back. So it was just sort of a, um, a, a sort of a thrilling image of, of the power uh, of the unconscious that it could swallow us up at any time. You know? 
but now we're back on the shore. But at least it just showed us how how um, uh, how infinitely uh, bigger it is than us, you know, and how small we are, and how vulnerable, uh, and maybe not vulnerable, but let's just say that um, it how, how immense it is compared to us. Its immensity is unimaginable to the ego when it actually uh, it is is revealed to us. So it, it's the idea of that we realize that the psyche is absolutely immense. And the ego is a very thin reed. You know, I, I, this is something that's really come over me is how thin the ego reed is compared to uh, the symbols of the last 250,000 or 400,000 years uh, that have come through uh, the, the life of, of homos, uh, the non knuckle walking hominids, you know, and young, uh, you, you know, the, uh, they say that we should not be called thinking man, we should be called symbol making man, you know, and how thin the ego is to this vast storehouse underneath. Okay, then the, the and also, you know, the, the unconscious, um, the, the, the water and the depths is actually representing two to me now, uh, and I hear comments on it is what you guys think the wisdom of of the um, of the created life that is on earth it, that the when we see the ocean we are seeing the wis that we we are seeing the wisdom that creates bodies the, and it, how how deep it is and how uh, bottomless it is you know the word abyss means no bottom, you know, there is no bottom, you know, no base. Okay, now the next thing we remember, we're on shore, so we, we survived it, but we actually, actually had a vision of, of something absolutely um, uh, mind-numbing, okay, especially when the pier started to collapse, okay. You know, you know one uh, thing uh, uh, Nietzsche said uh, about somebody, he loved to gaze into abysses when there was a railing in front. <laughs> you know, if there was no railing there, now gaze into the abyss, you know, and see that something's looking back at you or whatever it used to say. But anyway, the next thing we remember, we're on the shore, the scenes change, and you are now a young boy with your father. And we were very poor and we were Asian. Now, this is so interesting because, Gary, you have these dreams, too, where suddenly you're occupying another body, you know, uh, which is I've never had one like this. But I mean, you you've had ones where you were actually two. I can remember where you were actually um, a female. Isn't that right, Gary? Think? Yeah. OK, so now um, we are um, a young boy with our father. We're very poor and we were Asian. And this probably, it definitely has something to do with the wisdom um, that we've encountered through the feminine in the case of Adelaide. So, um, so the, the, that's kind of a, um, something that, that we, uh, I mean, I have not, um, uh, uh, is something that Roy is more intimate with. Okay, you were Asian. You are the young boy with your father. Now this, We've encountered the father and the uh, father's brother and the father's brother's son, you know, and, and the father's old business that you go back to. And uh, uh, so the father realm is very important, Roy. And I think it's important to Charles, too, you know, the father realm. Of course, it's so important to all of us, you know, but, um, but you're Asian. So now what does it mean to be Asian? You know, to be Asian, you know, to me means to be a, a little, um, not, not so, uh, I, I mean, to be a little closer to the earth, you know, uh, I, I mean, well, I have to hear what, uh, what Royce thinks, but, you know, Taoist or even Confucius, you know, practical and close to the earth and, and also ancient. And a, able to, uh, you know, have incredible patience to, 
you know. Uh, so we went to the Asian market to pick up some cabbage leaves that the lady there let us have. There were outer leaves of the cabbage that no one would want. Uh, that, that, so anyway, we get the, the refuse of the cabbage. So uh, we were very poor, you know. In other words, um, we're very poor. So that means, uh, what does that mean? I mean, we're very poor and it means that um, sort of uh, um, we, we've hit bottom, we're at a very elemental level uh, that um, at, at this elemental level, uh, what's most important are the instinctive things, you know, eating, you know, for one thing eating and shelter. So it's very elemental. It's not involved in what's my stock uh, price at today, you know, or whatever. Okay. Uh, and so we're just uh, trying, and we, we are, are eating even not fine foods, but very, very basic foods. Okay. So, and, and uh, uh, that's, now this, that's a very strange, we go from the, the, this great threat uh, then we were, uh, we're very poor. We're with our father. Uh, the feminine gives us some very, uh, poor quality food. Okay. And then, um, at, there was an old white bicycle back in the storage area. And, uh, uh, now it's a white bicycle. So it has to do with, it's a spiritual bicycle. It's one that has to do with, um, purity clarity, um, and uh, it, it has to do with the father world, I think, you know, the highest heaven, you know, and uh, um, now I had this feeling it was her son's bike, and he had died many years ago, but she, so she doesn't want to sell it, she doesn't have a son now, she doesn't need it, uh, but um, she's somehow keeping it because she treasures uh, the memory of her son, I could think. And then um, you, you, you thought maybe she could hire, maybe this feminine aspect could hire me. And if, okay, so if we can work as a poor person, move from the father's realm and work for this woman who provides us the cabbage, isn't this a odd set of images? You know, this, this great threat from the shark. And then this aspect of, um, we want to work for the woman who sells cabbage leaves. We can't afford to buy cabbages. But what we really want is the uh, spiritual way of getting along. The very simple spiritual way. And uh, I think this has to do with the, with the simplicity of the, of the life. So th there's an aspect uh, of this great threat in the, in the first uh, section uh, is followed with the, this path to simplicity, you know, a path to simplicity. It is almost uh, uh, a, uh, uh, I, I don't know, it's almost like a fairy tale of a very simplest, uh, a simple existence, a simple existence. You know, there's a guy, in, I don't know if you ever watched The Sim Simpsons, but um, he's, he's called, I think he's called Comic Book Man, and and he, he always is yelling out really loud, simplify, man. You're spending your whole life uh, just to have that car, you know. <laughs> You're throwing away your whole life just to have a car. Okay, well, anyway, uh, Gary, let's hear what you have to say about it. It's, I, I can't get over uh, how unusual this dream is. I'm just fascinated. But I, you know, I, I think I need to assimilate it. Yeah. So, you know, what I find interesting is like, you know, sometimes when we dream, you know, right at the outset, all of a sudden there, there's this thing where we're just falling into something, you know, and that's, that's kind of like the descent. And, and here we have something where you're at a high wooden fishing pier only to find out that no, you are not above the unconscious. And it can take you whenever it wants, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, that's that's what I got out of that. 
And then this next part, well, you know, I, I ferment things. And the most basic thing to ferment is cabbage. And, and well, what do you make with cabbage? You know, that's sauerkraut, you know, I mean, that's like, that's as, that's as cheap and as basic as it gets, you know, and it's probably also the simplest ferment to do. And, and to me, this is like, it's the negredo of ferments. And that's what I think we're really dealing with here. You know, you're very, you're, you're very much of the earth and you're working with the lowest of the low, the cabbage leaves, you know, it's like, and, and, and not the whole cabbage, the part of the cabbage which is taken off, which might be somewhat milt, wilted or deformed or, you know, have some, you know, insects might have chewed on it or something. And so then your, your father aspect, you know, is he, you know, he sees your interest in, in, in the white bike, which is like, you know, this has, it has a possibility of transformation, of being able to move you from place to place under your own power. You know, I love that image. And, and yet this woman who, you know, is probably somewhat of an anima aspect, it's like, no, no, you know, it's like, I will not sell this, you know, this, this has, this has feeling for me, you know, this is not, this is not something that you can just exchange for money, but you have the feeling that with a relationship with her, you know, we get into the relating aspect that, you know, but then this ability to move, you know, through your relationship to this woman that then she would then provide it, you know. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful and moving image, you know, it's one of those things you could make like a, a Christmas story out of, you know, it's very appropriate for the year, you know, <laughs> the time of year. <laughs> Well, so yeah, I yeah. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Well, let, let me. Uh, no, I I just wondered if you if you had anything more. Yeah. No, no. I think that sure. that's basically it. All right. Well, let me just add a little bit uh, that that when you were talking about where he could swallow us up at any point, and then I thought, is it death? Is it something that says that um, we don't have much time left, or something like that? You know. Then I thought this. We didn't survive. We're reborn. We've been reincarnated, you know, as another uh, being. I mean, this, uh, we suddenly, uh, the next thing I remember, I was on the shore. So does it mean that we actually um, did die there and were reincarnated in a, uh, another life, you know? And, and so now, and the life, is, is one of complete simplicity. Now, this is the one uh, that the unconscious or the dream maker chose. Forget that first part. This whole thing is just a dream of utter simplicity. Okay, but now what is the dream of this life of utter simplicity and simplicity? Is to have the white bicycle. And what is the white bicycle? It is. It seems to be. It's the treasure hard to attain. There's an aspect of it that is the. Uh, um, it is uh, almost like the philosopher's stone or something like that. It's the. It's the vehicle of transformation, and it's because it's white and because it is related uh, to um, uh, uh, someone who has been gone for many many years. So it's sort of almost a ghost vehicle. You know, it's a vehicle of, of it's almost a vehicle of, uh, that has transcended death or something, you know? It, it's related to the one who died many years ago. And so now, um, you know, it, it would be like this, uh, you know, um, my, uh, what, what if you inherited the clothes of someone who died a long time ago and you started to wear them, you know, uh, there would be a, a certain 
act of a certain amount of mystery in that clove when you that you would that you could feel you might not feel it but um uh, you, you might not but but it is you're suddenly wearing the clothes the persona of, of someone who is um is in another realm so so there's now now let me tell you this uh, you know the reason that the um that the uh, uh the uh um, uh, people would eat a bit of the heart or a bit of the brain of some great enemy was not for any morbid reason, but it was to, in, to assimilate um, the power that they had, you know, because they were always seen like they were greater than we were. And so, so it would enhance our power. But I see, uh, uh, Charles, are you uh, available or, or not? Maybe I think Charles might be maybe out making deliveries or something. Yeah. What? Well, can you tell us? Okay, Roy, why don't you uh, uh, blow us away and show us how we're completely on the wrong track? Yeah, I think Charles is having trouble with his mic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you got you guys did a really good job uh, going through this. Uh, my last dream that I did last week. Remember, I, uh, there was a lake. It was called Prima Materia. And there was a lake in the deep end had catfish in it. I wasn't gonna mess with the deep end. Well, this is the next dream that I had and it's about being over deep water. And I have had a couple other dreams with sharks that appeared in the deep water and, and I made it to the shallow water. So uh, this is a recurring theme in my dreams here lately. And uh, I, I think I'm supposed to steer away from the, the unconscious. I get the point, I get the message. So uh, I made it to shore and uh, I, I really like this little story, this uh, woman uh, that was at the market and let us have the cabbage leaves. Uh, it, it's, it's, very, it's very sensate, it's very practical, I mean, the, the, the father and the son are creative, you know. People don't eat the outer cabbage leaves. The market people clean them up and put them out there to sell them. And so there's, there's plenty of food there that's not sellable. And if you're a poor person, you can take that, make soup and different things. So it's just so pragmatic. And uh, I, I, just, I, I just felt in my heart that I could, that I could uh, take the place of this woman's son. You know, I could take that bike and run errands for and do things for, and uh, she would just let me have the bike eventually. And, and it was, it was a win-win situation. And that's not, that's not uh, messing with the unconscious. That's not, that's not looking at your life in a way unpragmatically, you know, that's not fantasizing. That's not being a mystic. Uh, that's not uh, starting from a place that has no substance. I, I'm, I'm embedded in the world and I'm, and I'm starting where I'm at and, and I'm creating. So it was just a wonderful dream for me. I mean, it made me feel really good. Yeah, the, the idea of the, of the, the catfish blow and that you drain the water and then you see the limestone on her head, but you're not going to deal with the deep water. And that's come up a couple of times so that we know that there's something uh, about a, a water that, that appears to have no bottom that is, um, uh, is, is um, disorienting it, to say the least. Okay. Is there something about it that's disorienting? So now here is a place where we can orient. Now we're orienting at the beginning, the prima materia, we're coming in there with nothing, you know, and yet with nothing, we are going to try to make a life. And uh, uh, what, we're, what we're going to try to do is we are going to try to, um, uh, to uh, work in concert with uh, this woman 
who sells the cabbages. And uh, um, like you said, uh, so I mean, it is just a very simple story. Now, how how more beautiful can you get it? Like you say, this is a dream. That now compare this to some of the dreams um, that that you had before that were had no human beings in it and no words. And now this dream doesn't have any words either. No words. No things are spoken. I mean, it's just sort of a a, a, a um, you know a wordless realization, but now not in in with with the instinctive animal realm, but it is with the uh, um, with a the next step up, okay, which is um, is the is the simple peasant life of a non. Uh, Ha, not a, not a, a, uh, a, of a civilized country, but one that is not um, overly civilized, you know, that is, is very close to the earth, farmers and things, you know, it's not, you're not going back to uh, caveman or, you know, some very, very primitive, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a higher levels, but it's not, uh, you, you know, this unbelievably complicated world that you have dealt with in uh, Florida you know, over the past 20, 30 years. I mean, haven't you said that, Roy, too, that, um, and you, am I imagining this or not, that, um, that, that the demands of that world is something that you just said you're not going to work with? Or how do you, you, say, you said at one time, about uh, how you manage or how you're going to manage or you're I'm not sure in what context you're yes I'm I, that's what I'm saying right. I'm not I, I whether I'm imagining it or not but uh, I think you have spoken before about I, I, I mean I, you I was talking earlier and, and maybe this will tie it in is that uh I knew that I I needed the sensate uh so I just started doing sensate but, but it's not that easy. A lot of stuff that you can do in Sense8 is, is not going to help you. You're going to go backwards. You know, it's not that easy. And, and maybe that's what I was doing for so many years. Here in Florida, you know, I ran a trailer park and I, and I uh, uh, had a wife and, a, uh, uh, and her eight-year-old when I met her and raised a, a young boy. And these are all sensate things. And, uh, I, you know, I was just doing it with uh, no knowledge. And, uh, but it was sensate. You know, it's better than no sensate. And uh, so I've, I've been struggling with that a long time. But the simplicity of the story and the dream, uh, I'm doing sensate. But because I'm poor, it works. Uh, because... Poor people are very instinctive. They have to be and survive. When you're on a survival level, you, you have to depend on your instincts or your toast. And, and the little story works really good. And the reason I, I think I was having so many complications is that I wasn't poor. I, I was trying to do these things that a poor person would do, but I wasn't poor. So that doesn't work because people don't understand. And people don't, people don't treat you the same. And I think it is, again, uh, these dreams that you've been having that are so elemental. This is an elemental dream, too. Mm -hmm. This is a, a dream that is, is showing a, a really unique vision. And this is why I've, I've said, Roy, that the dream maker in your dreams is so unique, is that it is uh, its vision it has for you is very instinctive not um that there's an aspect of it is that is uh is um it, it's very taoist like but you know it's been basically just be balanced you know just balance but not balance in the highly complex world but balance in your own body 
as a uh, but but with a a high um, highly formed ego, but but the ego is in complete service to the body, to the instinctive realm and its balance. And now in this case, it, it, it's stating it in more human terms, but but it also is stating it in, in, in the way of of, of an animal. A, 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 the way of a, of a, uh, of, you know, you know, Young said the uh, um, animals, if they could think, would be more moral than us because they never stray from what they are meant to be. Okay. All right. They always are what they're meant to be, where we, we always stray from what we're meant to we're be. We're not allowed to be what we're meant to be. Yes. And in, in these dreams, there always seems to be an aspect. Is they're not asking you to be the um, evolution of the God image that forms the new church? No, you know, but they are 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 uh, there, there is an aspect in there of achieving a level of balance that is almost. Uh, you know, um, is is like it reminds me of the rainmaker in the Taoist Taoist story. You know, the this this one he's not meant to be. Uh, he's just meant to simply be in balance. And I think that is. Do you, what do you think about that? Why just the balancing aspect? Yeah, when when I when I met Adelaide, uh, she said that I thought like an Asian. And uh, I love the Taoist, you know, like my friend Al, who's in my dream sometime, was a Taoist. And uh, that, that's all I want, uh, just, just to try to be in balance. And that, I, I would love that. And, and that's how I'm going to heal. Yeah, I think it, it is. Uh, anyway, it is it's absolutely a beautiful dream. Um, well, now, if, if Charles can't get his uh, uh, thing going, I I've been minute. trying to. Think. Oh, I can hear you now. Trying to speak. Okay, go ahead, Charles. Um, yeah. Um, I don't really. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't really have a lot of dream. I think what you guys have said about it already has been. Uh, really good. It's been very interesting to listen to. Could um, you tell us one of your sense. dreams? Sure. Um, I, I I don't remember all the dream, but just recently I had a dream where I was in this room with all these uh, girls and there was a snake on the floor and the snake had a yellow stripe going down its back and um, didn't really have a normal head. It was almost like someone had cut its head off and then just like made that hole like, into a mouth and then it had like a, like a spiked tongue coming out of its missing head. I don't know. It was, it was very strange thing. So the snake was on the ground and I kept jumping up high into the air to avoid it being bit by it. I wasn't afraid it would kill me. I was just afraid of the pain that the bite might cause. And, you know, upon coming down from jumping, one of the girls had uh, sort of caught me but just enough to kind of slow my fall. And I kind of freaked out and was like, hey, why are you doing that? Um, it's going to increase my chances of being bitten. But they were standing there, not worried about the snake at all. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I remember okay. from it. All right, let's, let's start over again. So you're in a room with a lot of girls. Okay, You're in a room with a, a, a lot, a lot. Now, this is very unusual for you, but you're in a room with a, a, a um, more than one anima. So the anima is very close. 
she's breaking through. You know, th this thing that you've had before is where you don't have any feminine in your dreams, or if it is, it's a it's a hamster or something. You know, but here the the feminine is is multiple. It's breaking through into your ego a, 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 a lot. Not Mount, but there is a snake on the floor with a yellow stripe on the back. Okay. Now remember, green is sensate, uh, blue is thinking, uh, um, the uh, red is feeling, and yellow is intuition. Uh, so uh, this is seems to be the snake of intuition. So this is this would be the snake. Uh, that is um, uh, related to uh, the passivity that was in my dream before, the the one who who knows but doesn't act. Okay, and uh, um, now what's interesting too is it has it it basically does not have a head, or, or it just it 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 seems like its head has become part of the body, and yet it still has fangs. And a, and a tongue, but it's sort of missing the skull, something like that. Is that close to it, Charles? Yeah, it didn't actually even have fangs, just that, like, slits on. The tongue seemed kind of sharp, and like, it was like a spike. Yeah, like a spike. Okay, but it still had fangs and it could bite you. Is that right? Well, anyway, I'm going to assume that's right. Uh, um, I, I didn't have, it didn't have any fangs. Oh, it didn't have any fangs? I was so afraid of it biting me. Yeah, it didn't have any fangs, but you were still afraid of it biting you. It's just, uh, yeah. I felt like it could have You're kind of cutting in and out. A little bit, Charles. Uh, but but anyway, it didn't have a head. It didn't seem to have fangs. But you're still afraid of it. That it's going to hurt you. It has the spiked tongue. Okay. And it keeps striking at you. And you keep trying to jump away from it. And while you're jumping away from it. Okay, that's okay. Let's just kind of go, um, go with what we think we have. Okay. And now, as you're trying to avoid being infected by this um, intuitive aspect of ourselves, which um, keeps us from acting. Okay, see, we're in the room with the feminine. There's more than one. If there's two or more, that means that they're breaking through in, in the unconscious anima and our uh, ego uh, are, uh, she's becoming very powerful. She's becoming very intense and she's be becoming very uh, uh, near at hand. And so, but now what's keeping uh, us uh, from relating to them is this aspect of us, um, this unconscious aspect. It doesn't have a head. So it's just completely unconscious. The, the fact that the, um, the dominant attitude of ego which tends to be intuitive in you and in me and it, even though it's very conscious it's very unconscious of the feeling and sensate world okay so it's headless when it, it when it's concerns the feminine and relatedness and sensate it's headless it, it, and it doesn't have any uh head now it it, it is is threatening us uh, from having a relationship the the feminine comes forward and 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 tries to uh, help us but um we're too focused um on on this aspect i'm not really too sure on that last part uh what exactly what it means where the woman catches us 
And we think that it just puts us in danger of being bitten by the, uh, by the fangless, headless snake. Uh, what, what do you think, uh, Roy, how it's related to the, uh, what, what, what does it mean that it's yellow, that it has, doesn't have a head? I don't know. I, I, I just speculate. I, uh, well, we're he's, had, he's had other dreams with snakes where they were very difficult to deal with. He, somebody else killed it or he killed it or anyway, it wasn't appropriately really dealt with. And uh, the snakes are very important in dreams. And, uh, it, you know, I, I could just pick one of the many things and, and like wisdom, uh, wisdom, uh, he doesn't know what it is. You know, he doesn't recognize it. Uh, just like you've been talking about the, uh, the, the Eskimo myth and, and uh, the, the spider woman, the, the, uh, the headless man, the animus, the headless man, uh, the women aren't afraid of that. They, they love the headless man. And uh, so they're not afraid of the snake. But, but Charles is, and, and, I, and I, think, I, think, I think it's, I'm going to say wisdom. He, he's afraid of a wisdom because he doesn't, he doesn't recognize it. And so that's why they're not afraid of it. And they're trying to help him, but he's, he's afraid. You it just it. throw some things around. It's the wisdom of the body without the head, okay? It's, it's the wisdom of the instinctive world uh, without the thinking punch, you know? And uh, uh, it, 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 that, that aspect. So it, is it related to, what do you think, Gary? Do you think it's on the, now, now the feminine doesn't seem to be afraid of it. It's only the, uh, uh, the, the, the thinking aspect of our ego that's afraid of it, of the headless wisdom of the body, as, as uh, Roy describes it. Well, the snake is a very Hermes-like, of, yeah. you know, creature. And the fact that it's headless, you know, so there are no fangs and stuff. And, it, and yet it's colorful, you know, so it has... It, it, there's, it, it seems very symbolic. It seems very important. And that basically it prevents him from, you know, relating in a useful form with the, you know, the women in the room and, and forming, you know, some sort of relationship. So it's a, it's, a mistaken reaction to, you know, to like a natural function that's arising from the underworld. Um, that's that's mostly what I get out of it. But but I, I think that it's headless is so important because that it's headless. All it can really do is signal. I mean, the, you know, there is no concern about it biting. But there's, a, you know, there's, there's a symbolic head, you know, that's made out of paper or whatever. And, and I just find that the whole imagery in this, I just find really fascinating. You know, I, mean, like, I just say the last Gary, uh, Roy's dream too. I mean, the imagery in it is really fascinating. It's just fascinating. But, but what's, what the most interesting thing is, okay, just reminding of uh, the snake. Remember also the snake swallowed the uh, hamster that was becoming human and swallowed it. And uh, um, so the snake in his dreams is uh, always seems, now I don't think it's malevolent because it's very close to nature. You know, it is nature, you know, but what it is, is seems to be, it's like me, I'm at war with the, the lower part of the st ancient storehouse, you know, which is the body and the psyche. I'm at war with it. And, uh, I, and I'm very passive, you know. And uh, in, in this case, first of all, the feminine is about to break through. So it's a pivotal 
moment in our psychic life. The feminine is about to break through. The room that we occupy is now full of, of feminine energy. You know, many girls are there. Okay, so it's us and many girls. Okay, but meanwhile, <laughs> you know, there's a dilemma. And the dilemma is this, um, is dealing with our own instinctive self, is, is, uh, which is, uh, we're so unconscious of. And it really has no head. It has no connection with our head. So, so sort of this head that would make it um, be, uh, we would see some affinity with it. Our body would see, uh, I mean, our head, you know, we're a decapitated head. Charles is a decapitated head. I'm a decapitated head. You know, I mean, we just, we're just heads. We don't have a body. Okay. And, but if we saw a body with the head and it was our body, we would have some affinity for it. You know, well, at least it's got a head. Maybe I can talk to its head. But if it doesn't have a head, so it's just body without a head. We can't have a discussion with the body without a head, you know? And, and so it almost seems as if our body and our head are fighting each other, okay? You know, our body and our head are in a fight, okay? You know, and, and, and there's no communicating with, the, with the, uh, the body without a head. And the, the body without a head is not interested at all in communicating with the head. So, so how do we resolve this? I mean, we just keep jumping away from it, you know? And, and we know that it can't hurt us, but we're afraid of it, you know? And it doesn't even have fangs. We're still afraid of it. It has to be, seems to have a spiked tongue. Now the feminine is friendly or is not at the feminine unless the snake is only visible to us and it's invisible to very, everyone else. The, the feminine is wondering, what are you afraid of? What are you worried about? This is just your body. Why are you so afraid of it? You know, and uh, you know, just just stop jumping up and down so much. But we're saying if we stop jumping up and down so much, then the body is going to come closer to our head, where which thinks it's God, by the way, and uh, we know then that we um, are not God. We're just an appendage of the body, you know. Uh, Roy, Roy, what do you think about that? Now, it's got the woman, the body, and the head. And they're all, uh, the woman and the, 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 the feminine tends to be the mediator and gets along with both sides. Well, yeah, I, uh, it's, it all sounds good. Uh, the numinous thing is, of course, the snake. That, that's where the numinae is. And uh, it, it, it's wisdom, wisdom of the body. Uh, that's, that's a difficult thing for an intuitive to connect with. And we we're just talking about all of us. And uh, I'm, I'm just trying to focus on that and, and just, I don't know how, you, how a person gets to the point where they, they're intuitive to get to the point where they can see how important that is. You know, how how do I do that? I, I, even when you even when you understand it intellectually, you know you have to do it. It's not just understand it intellectually. You have to figure out how to do it. You know that's the next step. You, know, you laugh. You, you think that's funny or simple, but it's not simple. It's a, it's a big thing, and, and that's the next step that you have to figure out. You should listen to my dreams. I mean, they're all. Uh, pretty much like this dream, a little bit, not quite so, in a different way. Gary, Gary do you have any thoughts about this? The, the feminine being uh, sort of uh, can't understand why the, why the dream ego is so afraid of this instinctive body aspect. With well, the, I, I like what, what Roy is saying, you know, because really, you know, what we're talking about is this is, you know, it's it's a way of experiencing. It's a way of being, and you know, you just have you have to do it, you know. And it's it's not an intellectual thing. 
Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to show you a, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, you, you know, one thing I think of that, that is sort of unusual about uh, snakes and, and kind of like chickens too, is, is they can survive for a little bit without a head, you know? I don't know. Uh, you know, they run around without a head after you head, cut their head off. You know, it's, uh, I, I just wanted to see if I could find anything about a headless snake. But uh, Charles, next time you get, uh, we know, I know if you were here and we could hear you, you would be telling us uh, things about the dream that would be very uh, instructive. Let's see if we can find a headless snake. Just a second. Uh, let's see. Let me just see if I can find a headless snake a second, just for fun. Because yeah. isn't that, you know, it's one thing to have a snake that is uh, just a snake, but to have a snake that is headless is uh, like this one here. Now, this isn't exactly headless, but uh, let's see if we can find this one. No, you know, one other thing is, is sometimes when you cut the head off a snake, the snake is, the head is still alive, you know. Let's see here. I'm just going to show you this, and then we'll leave here as we go. This is sort of a headless snake. You know, I don't know. It's a little scary. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> anyway... Try, Roy, that dream was beautiful, and I'll sh I'll start sharing some of my dreams, but uh, they they are of this character, and they really are. Uh, I'm not real proud of them, but uh, but they are they're they're very deep. I mean, very insistent and urgent, you know, about things. Well, anyway, I'll I'll keep in touch with you too, Charles, and and thanks, Roy and Gary. That was. This has been pretty fun. I, I, it was, it was fun for me anyway. So we'll see you guys all next time Wednesday if you're here. Okay, bye guys.